you're having to bear with our uh, AC issues which seem to pop up from time to time this being one of those weekends sorry about that um, but uh, we're thrilled to have Len Scott Walker here for his uh, new book DJ Screw uh, a life in slow revolution you know last time he was here we do you know the Houston rap book which was a monumental book and kind of shaping the, the uh, attention and the light and focus thrown on uh, Houston and the music coming out of here and uh, and I, I'm sure this is going to be just as well received and uh, we're thrilled to be kind of the launch pad for it here in Houston. Uh, I wanted to mention that um, afterwards uh, he'll be signing books over there after uh, he and Donnie wrap up up here and also as a added bonus we have um, Peter Best sent us some of the images prints um, uh, from the book that we have framed in the Record Ranch appropriately over the hip-hop section so if you want to check those out and uh, that's what I got for you. So without further delay, let's have a big round of applause for these guys before they say action and start rolling tape. Or what Thank virtual you. tape. <coughs> virtual tape. Electronic tape. No, in honor of DJ Screw, we're doing everything on videotape today. <laughs> oh man, all right, how y'all doing? How's everybody doing? Woo! Okay, okay. So listen, I go by the name of Donnie Houston. I host this thing called the Donnie Houston Podcast where we uh just chronicle this uh, Houston, this, you know, Houston the city's great uh, musical culture and a lot of screw stuff. And um, through that, you know, I've had the honor of connecting with Lance Scott Walker. Y'all give it up for Lance real quick. Thank you. Lance, um, he's, he, you know, he's, whether he knows it or not, he served as like a mentor to me in this journalism journey, you know, so uh, it's an honor to even do this. But listen, we're, we're not here to talk about none of that. We're here to talk about a life in slow revolution. How many people have picked up the book already? That's kind of weak. That's kind of weak. What y'all think about it? Is it live? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. All right. So uh, we'll just start it out, man. Uh, Lance, I know, you know, you've been working on this for a while, man. It's finally out. How you feel? It feels good to have it out. It feels good to get out on the road. It feels good to be driving around Texas, seeing everybody and, and uh, getting some feedback on it. You know, it's like this been kind of, kind of this silent work for so many years because nobody's seen it. And now it's really out there and, you know, they're getting a look at it. Yeah. What's what's been some of the uh, reaction like being able to go out and like touch people and you know talk to them about the book and just all of that like good reaction, solid yeah. reaction. And you know people seem to be reading it really slowly, which I kind of like, you know. Like people say, "Oh, I'm reading it. I'm taking it slow." It's like, "Well, it's a book about screw. You probably should go slow." Yeah. You know. But uh, but yeah, but overwhelmingly positive and um, you know, lots of people really appreciating, you know, people who've been fans of DJ Screw forever that kind of didn't really know all the little pieces you know connect the dots and uh you know that's what i tried to do yeah talk about because i mean you know you've done the houston rap tapes you know what i mean amazing classic book as far as the culture is concerned but talk about wanting the decision to hone in on dj screw you know mm -hmm. yeah you know <clears throat> i started you know the houston rap project with peter best we're getting a little bit of feedback quinn um well, i don't know if he's controlling it um oh there we go um but uh you know, I started the um, the Houston Rap Project in 25, uh, 2005. Peter Best started it first. You know, that was his project in 2004. And we go way back to, like, 1996. I've been friends with him. And, you know, he uh, when he was going around taking pictures of punk rock shows and I'm playing in punk rock bands, you know, hey, kid, what, what are you doing with those pictures? I don't know. You know, and, like, it just, and we became friends. This is, like, 1996. We became friends. We stayed in touch. He moved away to, like, go to school for photography and, you know, really go to grad school and you know he moved away to san francisco chicago london and then he ended up in new york starts coming back to take these pictures and you know 
a few months in, a few trips in, he's like, hey, look, you know, I, I go and I take pictures of everybody and they tell me these stories and like, stories don't end up in the pictures. You know, yeah, the picture tells one story, of course, but like, you should get on, because I was writing for the Houston Chronicle then. He's like, you need to get on board, write this with me. So that, that's how I started in on, you know, and of course, I'm from Galveston. I've been in Houston since 1992. So like, I had a deep, deep love for Houston and like, I was like, that's a bet. I was into it. So um, I started on that with him in 2005, you know, right before the wave of everything really happened, you know, with, with everybody really breaking in 2005. And so we were kind of right at, right at, right before that happened. And then like all that starts happening. I'm like talking to Peter, like this shit's not normal, right? Like this is kind of <laughs> like, we, we started like right before something really crazy is happening. Right. And so that was pretty wild. But, but all through that, you know, I was talking to, I was studying, you know, talking about DJ screw interviewing people about DJ screw and like getting a picture of him as an artist, which of course was important to the book. But you know, what really sent me on this journey was like to make a portrait of him as a, as a human being, you know, as a person, because like the, the stories that people told about him as a person, were what, were what really got me. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's all in here. Can you talk about, uh, I mean, just the process, man, because it's so detailed and you have, I mean, everybody's in here. Some of the people in here. We have Miss Tony in here. Uh, we have Russell Washington. There's so many people that you've talked to and they're kind of like, you know, you narrate a little bit and then they're just jumping in and, you know, telling it, man. So talk about the whole process. Yeah. The, the process is really about like building a library, yeah. you know, for years. Like I didn't, I was real quiet about this project forever. Like even people in the SEC will tell you, like, I didn't, I didn't go around saying, I'm writing a book about DJ Screw. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even announce it until 2019. I didn't announce it until actually, I actually signed the deal for the book. I worked on it for, you know, 10 years without having more than 10 years without having signed a deal on it. Because I just knew, you know, whatever is going to happen is going to happen, mm -hmm. you know. So I just kept building a library of stuff. You know, I was just building a library of interviews and going through and interviewing everybody that I could and, and learning about who else I should talk to, you know, and try to, just trying to catch up with people. And, um, and then so that, and going through those interviews and, and finding parts of them that I was like, okay, I think this right here, this is, I like the way they tell this story. And I like what's in it. I like the facts that are in it. I like kind of the the character of the person that comes out in it, going through and like highlighting parts of my interviews and kind of figuring out a chronology of how things worked. And then I didn't actually start putting the book together until um, 2014 or so. And then in 2015, I asked Roger Wood over there, who's the author of Down in Houston and Texas Zydeco and House of Hits. He's written three books for University of Texas Press. And I said, hey, you know, what, uh, you know, what's, that, what's that experience like? You, you like writing for them? He said, I get one check a year and my book stays in print. Hmm. I was like, that's all I want. <laughs> because for my first two books, I didn't get paid anything, and they went out of print. So, you know, I, so I wrestled the rights away from Houston, for Houston Rap Tapes, and then they republished that, and they said, okay, get to work on the screw book, because I had to jump through all kinds of hoops. You know, they, we need a book proposal from you, we need uh, sample chapters, like we need, you know. And so it was years before I had that ready. Hmm. Um, but really, that was the process, is like figuring out kind of the parts of the oral history that I wanted to highlight, and the, and the really just good stories, you know, good stories that like tell you something about the people in the stories, but also tells you something about the person telling the story, yeah. which is why I quoted everybody at length and, um, and kind of the hybrid narrative slash oral history um, structure of the book, which I didn't know UT was going to go for. You know, they, they were kind of like, yeah, I don't know. That sounds kind of wacky. It's like, yeah, it's totally wacky, but like everything innovative is wacky yeah. at first. Everything innovative that you've ever experienced in life is crazy at first. So just wait, and then I put it together, and I sent it to them, you know, in the kind of the format it looks like now, and they're like, okay, we think it works. We're gonna let you do it. Yeah. I'm glad they did because it's really important. Screw was about community, and the book is about community in that way. It's important, and it's really, it's real and raw, and like, you get. I mean, it's just exactly how they say it. You know what I mean? Like, I've interviewed some of the guys, so I could read it in their voice, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. this is exactly what I'm talking right yeah. now. You know what I mean? I, w I want people to see themselves in the book. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I want to get the want to get the vernacular right. I want to get the slang right. I want to get the accent right. I want to get the emphasis right. You know, I'm from Galveston. I lived in Houston for a long time. I know how people talk. You know, and I really, really wanted to get that on the page really accurately because, like, I've I've done interviews that where I've been interviewed, and I've gone back and read it, and I was like. I don't use that word, yeah, right, you know, right, like, right, like get it, right. get it exactly right. The, you know, the person that you're interviewing chose those words for a specific reason, whether they like really thought about it or whether it's just come freestyling, you know, whatever it was, they said what they said specifically in every word that they say in every emphasis and every pause, all of that really matters. Yeah. Talk about, um, let's get into some of the fun stuff, man. There's a lot of really, really great stories in here. Tell me some yeah. of the things that like kind of blew your mind when you started diving into it and maybe either change your perspective on things or just open up your mind to like just 
things like I wasn't even aware that this was even a screw thing, you know? Uh huh. Well, you know, finding the DJs from the Hill Country was a big one. You know, um, I don't know who, who's been through what parts of the book, but there's uh, there was there were two DJs early in Screw's life, uh, Daryl Butts and um, and DW Sound, and these were like guys that were in the Hill Country and they had equipment. DW DW Sound was a real DJ who was actually out doing gigs in like Lagrange. He was from Lagrange, but he was doing gigs in like Giddings, you know, Weimar, you know, all kinds of different places in the Hill Country. And he was coming to Houston and he was buying tapes and uh, and he was getting tapes Kids Jam and taking them back hmm. to Smithville with him. And so like, and, and somehow it gave it to Michelle and Michelle gave it to Screw or somehow or another. So early on, they were hearing tapes of Kids Jam, which if anybody doesn't know, you know, Kids Jam was a really important uh, radio show here and, you know, started in 82, 83, somewhere in there and ran for forever, really. Mm, early and 90s for sure, at least 10 years, I would think. At right? least, no, it was, yeah, it was later than that. They kind of moved it around. I think it ended up on Friday nights at some point, but I was on Saturday mornings and I used to get it in Galveston because I lived on the backside of Galveston, like on the bay side, on the west end. If you lived in the city of Galveston, you, there was a lot of Houston radio you couldn't pick up because there was so much interference and you had Texas City between you and, and Houston. But I lived far on the West End and I could pick up KPFT and I could pick up KTSU. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's where I would pick it up. But yeah, the, interviewing those guys would like, felt like a real get. You know, you know what I mean by a get. Yeah, when you for get sure. somebody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Corey Blunt is our get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whoever, get, yeah. <laughs> whoever gets Corey Blunt for an interview, like, that's, a, yeah. that's, yeah. that's the <laughs> ultimate get. Yeah, yeah. But, but those guys, you know, learning about that stuff and learning about DJ Screw, you know, first getting on turntables when he was a, just, a, just a kid and first touching, like, real equipment, that was, that was something special. I like, you mentioned Kids Jam, but, you know, it's interesting that you mark, you know, the 1986 and that being a pivotal year, you know, mm -hmm. the move from Smithville to Houston. And yeah. you get the Kids Jam and, you know, all the big city stuff. And he's digging into the DJ thing and he's meeting Al D and, like, all these types of things. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm putting really important era. Yeah. And, you, you, you know, got to wonder, like, what happens if he stays in Smithville and, you know, and that's, and that's his life and he stays out there and he, does he pursue DJing the way he did? You know, I don't know. But once, once he gets to Houston, he's got more of a, he's got access to records for one. He's got a lot more places where he can go. There were a lot of record shops then, um, you know, and um, he's got people that are giving him records. And then once he moved into Quail Meadows, he was around a lot of people. You know, Quail Meadows, an apartment complex on Telephone Road, still there, hundreds of units. You know, Quail Meadows is like five blocks long or something like that. It's hundreds of, and lots of hustlers back in the day. Lots of people used to go in there to get their stuff. And those hustlers were like, also, go get you a tape. You know, and so I think really being in that community and meeting the people he did in that community, you know, Poppy, Frank, Papa Watts, mm -hmm. Ray Holmes, you know, all the all the people, Bernard Barnes, Toe, Toe who's yeah. the first one who bought the tape, you know, all that crew, you know, they were really supportive of him in the beginning and really looked out for him and like really, you know, really helped to bring people to him from different neighborhoods all over the South Side. Yeah. And even the, the, the chain of like Daryl Scott, Michael Price, DJ Screw, uh -huh. that whole like lineage, you know. Yeah. You cover that. Like it's, you know, we don't really get a lot of, usually when people talk about Michael Price, it's like a real like flash in the pan, but you kind of uh -huh. dove into him a little bit more. You know? As much as I could, yeah. you know, Michael Price died really early. He was, he was murdered in 1993. And so, you know, his, his time with Screw, he was kind of a protege of Daryl Scott. And uh, so his time with Screw was pretty limited, but I think he was really influential on him because he was so enthusiastic about the idea of slowing music down. And he didn't do it the same way. You know, he would slow stuff down. He'd had a boom box and he'd drive a screw into the back of the motor and that would slow it down. How that works, I don't exactly know. I just know 10 different people told me that. So uh, I guess I should try it, right? <laughs> Maybe it's too late. The book's out. <laughs> right, right, right. But, uh, but, you know, he was really enthusiastic about that. And then, you know, Daryl Scott was available. You know, he had a shop, and Screw would go down to the shop and, and talk to him and call him. And I saw D. Scott on uh, Friday night, and he gave me a stack of mixes like this, old tapes. I, I was and, that's my first question for D. Scott. I was like, can I digitize some Daryl Scott mixes? Because I've never heard of Daryl Scott mixes. He, and I had heard some of them, uh, yeah. but I hadn't heard. That was, that was before my time. Tony yeah. in here like, what? Yeah, I never heard them before. Yeah. I hadn't, you know, I had heard some of them, but I hadn't heard a lot of them that have, like, the doubling. He didn't call it chopping. He called it doubling. Um, and but now I've got a couple that have got the doubling on it. It's really interesting to listen to. His touch is very different than Screw. You know, Screw like a, a DJ is. You know, a DJ is a drummer. A DJ is you know really like you get up there DJing and it's like you know you're putting your your physical rhythms into what you're doing, right? And Screw had a very specific you know swing to his physical. Any drummer that you like listening to, it's not because they hit hard or because they do a bunch of 
you know, fills or anything. Yeah, it's because their swing. It's because yeah. their groove. Yeah, yeah, their swing. And Screw had a very specific swing to the way he was doing stuff. And Daryl Scott had a very specific swing. And it's a different touch. What's the, if, if you had to say just uh, what would be the difference you would say between like a Screw and a, a Daryl Scott style of DJ? Even though I know, of course, the obvious, you know, Screw took the thing and he slowed the whole tape down and he yeah, was more yeah, yeah. into the tricks and all of that. Well, but. Scott's tapes aren't slowed down for the most part. Mm. You know, they, he had a couple songs slowed down on some tapes. But, and that was, that, that influenced Screw tremendously, just those few songs, you know, Fresh is the Word and uh, A White Horse by Laid Back, you know. <clears throat> so there were songs like that that were slowed down, but, um, but I'd say more that the doubling or chopping was probably a bigger influence you know, on him, but it's a different touch. I don't know how to explain it. You know, Screw's cuts kind of feel a little bit deeper and a little bit rougher and a little bit raw because he was going to tape. And I guess at, at the time, D, D. Scott was too. But um, just a very different, very different feel where I think Screw kind of dug deeper and really slowed stuff down and kind of chopped into stuff. Whereas Scott's cuts were maybe a little bit quicker and he's kind of, you know, it's a little. I don't want to say flashier, but it's definitely some more flash to it. It's a, it's a very different thing. I can tell how he was influenced, but it's a very different thing. Yeah, it was it's interesting because uh, you know you were talking about you know the screw thing and we're talking about styles and all that, and it's very interesting that it's like a common theme of like when screws coming up, everybody's hearing about this DJ who's so great, and they expect to be like blown away when they go over to walk over to to meet him and they go to his apartment and it's kind of like for lack of a better word, it's kind of like a piece of shit setup, but he's like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he's killing it. He's like, yeah, man, uh, yeah, we go to D meet DJ Screw and there's wires and this is open and all this uh -huh. and it's just like a mess. But people are you know just blown away from that. Yeah, yeah, but that was that was part of his genius too. Yeah. Like early on when he's in Smithville, you know, he's got a boom box. He's got a, a turntable over here to the side. He's got like another cassette recorder. He figures out how to wire them up and uh, maybe even splitting wires. I don't know exactly what he was doing, but um, using the, um, the, the, the switch between like, you know, the phono and the tape on the, um, on the boom box as a fader to go back and forth between stuff and then had an, like, little, another little tape recorder and he's making tapes right in front of that. So <clears throat> early on, He's got gear that's like kind of from all over the place. He's borrowing a turntable from uh, Daryl Butts, you know, or he's going over to Daryl Butts' house and just using his setup while, because Daryl Butts worked at night and then he slept during the day. And so Screw would go over there during the day and put on headphones and just go to work and use his records. And so, you know, he really made the best out of what he had at any given time. And then, you know, as he's getting a little bit more money, he's at Quail Meadows and he's selling some tapes and, um, you know, he starts going to Radio Shack. That's where he starts, <laughs> you know, and he's, he's getting little pieces to add to the, you know, and, and I'm sure, it, you know, being consulted, you know, by people around him, oh, well, you know, get this, get that, and, you know, kind of slowly picking up gear. He never got to the point where he was like, had like a big fancy studio. It was more like processors kind of stacked on one another, and, you know, he was getting a lot of d tape dubbing machines. But, uh, you and know, he, I think piece by piece he was doing that. You talk about, too, about him, like how early he got into production. Like, as he's buying all that, he's getting keyboards. He wants, you know, he's uh -huh. getting into all that kind of stuff, too. Yeah. Um, man, but you also have, aside from, you know, his DJ screw stuff, but there's also like these really great side stories. Like, I was just telling you, you know, my favorite story that stands out in there is the ESG story. Like, everybody <laughs> knows ESG is a legend, H Town legend, one of the greatest freestylers, you know. And there's a story in the book about, um, it's, it's with their, he's in the backseat riding with Will Lean and head of the Botany Boys. Uh -huh. And, you know, the police get behind Will Lean and they pull him over. And ESG basically, if you know ESG, you know, he's good at, looking at things and kind of just directing room. He can freestyle what he's looking at. And he freestyled his way out of them getting this ticket. Off the like, badge. Yeah, off, off the, the badge. Off like the badge. He's reading the badge. Guy and all yeah. that. Like. Because, because the cop was like, man, I know this car is stolen. And they're like, no, 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 we're some rappers. We're going to the studio. He's like, y'all aren't rappers. And they're like, we're rappers. And as soon as he says, y'all aren't rappers, ESG starts going. Officer Hines, you know, he's using his name. And, and the officer's like, all right, y'all get out of here. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of the most amazing stories. What's, uh, that's my favorite story in there. What's, what's some of your favorite stories like that, that in there? That's a good one. Yeah. Um, that's, that's up there. Um, wow, let me think. What are my favorite stories? You know, my, my, I got to say, n nobody here probably is at the end of the book, but I got to say the last section of the book is my favorite. My very, very favorite. You got to the end? The section as far as the, the legend aspect after he's passed away, or are you talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the last section of the last chapter. You're know, not that far yet. I don't know if I, I've read the whole thing, but I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't know exactly what part that is. I can, I because I read the book in the sense of like the places. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you say like it's in this section, I'd be like, yeah, I read that. It's yeah. a section called Screw Love, and it's a very, yeah, 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 it's yeah, a very yeah, yeah. end, it's yeah, a very yeah, end yeah, of the yeah. book, and it's it's really just family talking about him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. my it's my favorite section of the book. Hmm. 
I mean, uh-huh. you better end with your favorite section, right? <laughs> I, I feel that. I feel. What are some of the things? Because I mean, it's, it's so much. I know there's some things that you were like, man, I really want to put this in here, but uh, you know, it just didn't make the cut. I had to cut a lot. Yeah. I had, when you turn in a book, no matter what it is, you, you just turned in a book. I'm sure you had to cut a bunch. They're just like cut. We're like, what am I supposed to cut? They're like, I don't care. Just cut. Whatever you turn in, cut it. So, um, so I had to cut entire sections out of the book. I had to cut a big section I did on 25 lighters. And I just kind of had to look at some of those sections like, man, you know, maybe I'll turn it into an article. You know? what, what's, what are some of the things in the 25 lighter section uh, you were talking about? In there? Well, I talk, this, talk tell the story of, of how it happened. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how uh, you know, uh, DJ DMD recorded, um, you know, a couple of freestyles with the screwed up click for the song So Real. So recorded one with him and Al D and, and DJ Screw rapping and Al D wrote a verse for him. I didn't know they did that in the same day. They did in the same day. That that tripped me out. Yeah, they did in the same day, and so then there was a screwed up click freestyle um, that he did over over the so real beat, um, which, which I think is based on the Isley Brothers track, if I remember right. And um, and then he did another freestyle, and they just went for like from what he said, he was like two hours, you know. That sounds crazy, but I also kind of don't have trouble believing that. No, it is. Yeah. I remember Cino telling me, like, he was kind of like, he Cino didn't was give it, too yeah. much, and he was like, man, why y'all giving them all them verses? Because <laughs> yeah. they were just going, you know? And he recorded them for, forever, yeah. and then went back through and, um, and, and was finding stuff in there that he really liked, and started cutting some of that into another track that he was working on. And, um, and you know, A-Ball and MJG had just, okay, now I can't remember the name of the song. But there was a song in there where... Uh, where uh, MJG a- says, 25 lies on my dresser. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then he says something else beyond that. But, oh. but Kiki, had, you know, that song had just come out and Kiki was just kind of riffing on it. And he says that part and then he follows up, just got to get paid. You know, he's, he's doing his riff on it. But that was something that really jumped out um, for DMD. And he took that and used it as a hook and, and created created the, the song 25 lighters so I had to take that whole the section is it's important to the legacy of screw it didn't so much totally involve screw but uh, that and that's why I ended up pulling it out because I had to cut something but uh, but I have you know at some point I'm sure I'll write an article where I'll, I'll expand on it even further and it'll be bigger than it would have been in the book yeah I like how you also uh, touch on the importance of guys like a poppy like a stick one like these yeah. guys are just as important as the guys who are rapping you know yeah yeah, yeah, and you you know you might hear them freestyling a little bit on the tape. Poppy used to host some of the Club Nouveau tapes, you know, uh, but they're not names that really jump out for a lot of people. But super, super important. Man, I wish I would have got Poppy. Yeah, I tried. I talked to Poppy a bunch of times, but I never like got him for an interview and really got to. But I but it, people like like him that I didn't get to talk to, I still wrote about him because I was like, I want to talk about him in the book. Yeah, and I, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was one part you were saying like his influence was like he was the one telling people, y'all need to go get this tape. Y'all yeah. need to come get these tapes. Yep. Like he was the one bringing people together. Mm-hmm. He was he was the one, and so I hope that comes across in the book. Of course, he's not going to toot his own horn that way, but a lot of other people are saying, yeah, Poppy was the one. Yeah. Yeah. What? Because um, you said you know you want to write a book about DJ Screw to kind of give people. Just an inside look of more than just this DJ or this, you know, slow down guy or whatever. What would you want people to walk away from uh, just with their impression of who DJ Screw was as a person, as a man, as a musician, as all of that, you know? Um, I would want them to see the love, you know, the love around him, the love he had for people. You know, the, we talk about how, like, you know, people felt like they were his best friend. That's because, you know, that, that's not just something that they made up. You know, that's like how he made them feel. You know, and so many, so many people told me that, you know, and it's like those kind of stories that like really, really made me want to do it because it could be a great artist, you know, over here, but that some, some great artists that we listen to are fucking assholes, you know? So, but like the more and more I learned about him, I was like, God, he was an amazing person, like a really, really amazing person and the way that he connected with people and the way that people still feel connected to him. Look, look around the city, drive around the city, you know, look at the shirts, look at the murals, look at the tattoos, you know? People, people still experience him. They still feel him. And that's why I finished the book the way I did. Because I was like, I want, uh, you know, I want it to kind of feel like we're still talking about him as if he's kind of here. Because that's how people talk about him. Yeah, yeah. What, um, man, should we take, you want to do some questions from the audience? We can do questions. That's it. Anybody got any questions? Y'all want to do some questions for the panel? Any questions? Questions, questions. No questions? Craig Long? Oh, you just, you <laughs> B-Boy Craig. What's up, man? How you doing? What overall influenced you to take on, you know, of all the, the legends wandering around Houston at that time, uh-huh. you know, in the early 80s and uh, the mid 90s and stuff, what drew you particularly to this one? Because um, he was a nucleus. 
you know dj screw was the center of something like think about like all the old school crews you know back in the day were all built around djs right the dj was the star you know the mc was just somebody off to the side until they just started standing in front of the dj you know but screw really probably one of the last people that you can say where like a whole movement was built just around the dj you know there's other djs out there who are superstars but they're not necessarily like building a movement around themselves like that so for me it felt like okay well if i go in and i focus on screw then it it branches out from there and there's all these other people that i can talk about you know and like and yeah you're right i mean there's you could do a book about little kiki you could do a book about little about fat pad or big hawk or big mo or or anybody you know who's still alive, you know, and like you, you could definitely do a book about them. But I figured if I, you know, in working, I was attracted to him as a person for one. But um, but also I felt like if I focus on him, then there's a whole world that comes out from that. And I could see how he was moving through Houston and Smithville and kind of different different eras in in both places. And I and I, as I was going, I was like, wow, well I can talk about the history of like where Houston was when he got here, or what where Houston was when he arrived when he was a kid. You know, because a lot of people didn't know that. You know, that's the big shocker of the book. Screw grew up in fifth. You know. Cashmere Gardens, Fifth Ward, you know, when he, was, when he was a kid. Then he went back to Smithville, and then he discovered hip hop, and then he comes back to Houston, and it's a different thing, and he's on the south side, and not connected to the north side anymore in that same way. Um, but, you know, to tell that story, and I, and I was just under, seeing how his story fit into all these other historical movements of times that he was in Houston. Yeah. We got a question right here. I think the craziest stuff I made sure I put in the book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was stuff I had to cut, you know, and there were some, there were some pretty out there kind of claims, you know, <laughs> from, from some folks um, that I didn't, um, I'm going to be you responsible know. for. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was some stuff where you kind of like, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you know, these memories are 25, 30 years old for some people. And, you know, and you have to, so, you know, I had, a, I had a way that I would go about it where I would say, okay, where did DJ Screw live when you met him? That's how I would ask people. Okay, so because I knew where he lived when. I was able to figure out exactly where he lived when he did. And um, so I knew that, like, he lived on Greenstone from the end of 93 through about 99. All right? So I'd ask him, okay, well, where did Screw live when you met him? Well, he lived on Greenstone. Okay, well, what year did you meet him? 80, 88. No. So, you know... So there's there's kind of slippery stuff like that you kind of have to, you know, you kind of have to, sometimes you have to kind of figure out a way to illustrate two different things that kind of have to be true side by side, but don't necessarily make sense on their own, if that makes any sense. You know, it's, it's an oral history, so it's kind of imperfect and it's based on people's memories. And, uh, you know, there's a, um, you know, it, in the end, really, there's a lot of mythology that surrounds DJ Screw, and I didn't want to completely smash that apart. I wanted to get in and talk about the person, but I also didn't want to do away with the mythology that's around him, kind of the legend that's around him. Um, so, you know, but that's the nature of doing it as an oral history and, and, and involving other people's stories and kind of letting them, letting them tell their stories. And, and, um, I'll, I'll, but I'll think of an answer. As soon as we're done with this, I'll end up thinking of an answer to your question, so hang around. With the with the wild stories, uh, one of my uh, another favorite was because uh, we've only I've only heard this talked about one type of way, but when you talked about DJ Screw and Watts at Frenchies with Al D and Poppy, and like when Al D came with his response, it was just like the most Al D. You <laughs> right. know what I mean? Right. That's it, a perfect example of what yeah. I'm talking about. You've yeah. got two very different recollections of a uh, of an event. And the one person who was in the middle who would actually remember how it went down is no longer with us. <laughs> so I was like, well. I'm just going to put them both in there and say, well, okay, Al D has a different recollection of this day. Let's hear Al D. <laughs> if y'all ain't read the book, y'all get to this story, y'all go, it's, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. You just know somebody almost got ran over by a car or something like that. It's, it's crazy stuff going on, man. Mm -hmm. It's crazy stuff going on. But uh, yeah, man, so anything, what's, what's next, man? I know you got all the, you know, you got a lot of research you're sitting on over there, man. So can you tease what's the, I know you, you got to have your next idea if you want to let, let the cat out the bag. I'm gonna put this to the side for a little bit as far as working on this. I'm gonna I'm gonna be traveling this year and I'll be doing doing a lot of stuff you know for it this year. Um, but as far as working on something else with DJ Screw, I do have a big library of stuff. Um, but 
it'll wait a little while. But uh, let's just say it's not going to disappear. Put it that way. Yeah. 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 But the next the next book I'm working on is about Galveston. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, we got any more questions before we uh, close out? We got one in the back over here. Um, what's your favorite Leaning on a switch. Oh. Who's a freestyle king? I can't answer that. I'm gonna get in trouble. I can't answer that. I mean, who's a freestyle king? Okay, we have any volunteers? Who who's a freestyle king? Y'all can answer. See, nobody wants to answer nobody that Nobody will be responsible no, no. for that one. Uh-uh. <laughs> nobody wants to answer that. That's cool. That's cool. I, I would have to say there's several, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you can think of three candidates right off the top of your head, yeah. and I don't know how to pick from those three. Yeah. And, yeah. Freestyle champs. Freestyle yeah. champs. I say kings. I, I mean, I, I don't put it as one. I, I mean, it's like four or five you can put. You yeah. Know. It is, but if they all go against each other, then what you going to do? Mm. Okay, well then, Miss, Miss Tony. <laughs> if they all go against each other, who you going? Who's going to win? You have to pick one. Okay, so who you pick? No, you, you have to pick you one. Pick one. Who, are, who are the candidates? This is your scenario. Okay. Uh, oh, see, now she's going to make us give it a list. That's I mean, how, we're we're, get, I'll, give you, I'll, give, you, I'll give you five. I'll give you five. Okay. And you can't really get in trouble for this. If we go Fat Pat, Kiki, ESG, Flip, and um, I don't know. Who else would you put you gotta in You got to put Mo in there because he's singing freestyles. Okay, that's a good you know, one. You know, he's singing. I'd say Fat Pat. That's what I would say. Yeah. Can you talk about your experience? Because since we got you here, because you know, how how long do you uh, go back with, with Fat Pat? Uh, go back with Fat Pat's like ninety three, ninety four. Hmm. And with DJ Screw. DJ Screw around ninety one, uh, ninety two. He was DJing at a club called the Midnight Hour. Yeah. My brother was the bouncer, so I was up there. I didn't know him as DJ Screw then. I just knew him as the DJ. Uh, when we actually met. I met him through the other ladies in the clique with me, Tori and Vaughn. They took me to his house. And I started freestyling and flowing, but I was aggressive with it. I would flow anybody I saw. So me, Duke, Kiki, Naki was in Screw Kitchen flowing. Screw had Thursday nights at Carabana, and we'd go support him. He'd have a freestyle session during the show. And I had no idea who ESG was. Him and Big 50 were standing over in the corner getting ready to freestyle, and I wouldn't start freestyling on him. And ESG was like, give me a number. So we exchanged numbers. The next day, he called, we went to his house, we flowed for him. He had already completed the Swingin' and Bangin' album, or the Ocean of Funk album, <clears throat> and he told his manager that he wanted us to be on the album. So he tried to get us to do the introduction. And after we flowed then he said, nah, wait a minute, we gotta add another song. So that's when he added Smoke On, and that's where it started. Hmm. Nice. That's a yeah, good one. Clap right it there. up. That's a good one. <clears throat> Tony the Tiger. <laughs> nice night. Where's Russell Washington at? I saw him around here. Where's Russell was, uh, he was over there last yeah. I saw him. Okay, cool. He may have snuck out. Okay, cool, cool, cool. We got other questions? Oh, he's in the back there. We got uh, other questions? Any questions? Any questions? Nah. We close it out. Y'all ready, y'all ready to, to get some books? Everybody here? Y'all ready to buy the book, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's do that, man. We got Lance here. He's going to uh, sign some books for y'all and everything. Um, listen, I appreciate y'all. I'm sure Lance Thanks really y'all. appreciate y'all. Thanks y'all for, so much for coming out on a Sunday. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to Donnie. Thanks to Tony. Hey. <clears throat> yeah. All right, well, we'll be y'all in the back. I'm going to get some books, so I got the book already, but I'm going to get some books, too, so. Oh, ready. That's what it is. See y'all over. All right. Oh, yeah. Donnie Houston. Donnie Houston. Subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man.